Um, so really quick for people that are, um, watching this later, if you bought one of the first, um, copies of this, what first couple copies of this book recently, um, this, there's just one little like typo on number nine that I wanted to point out. Um, so just really quick, just change that in your book to say both for number nine. Okay. So, um, let's see. This is just going to be like a review quiz, basically. So in the figure above, AB is parallel to DE and angle DCE is a 90 degree angle because pi over two radians is just 90 degrees. If cosine of B is equal to X over five, then which of the, uh, which of the following is equivalent to sine of E? So we're looking for stuff that's equivalent to sine of E out of these options. Okay. So, um, let's see if these are parallel, sometimes it can help to like extend out the lines, which is why I'm doing that. So people can see what I'm talking about and extending out the transversals. So we're talking about sine of E over here. We wanted to extend these lines out. There we go. Okay. So let's see, this is B, E, okay, so if this is E, that means that this has to also equal E right over here. You can also remember that, like, when you see these guys, um, what's it called, that the, I forget the name of it, uh, can't remember. If it comes to me, I'll use the exact term, but basically, like, you can remember that, like, the opposite, like, angles over here are always equal to each other when you see, like, these types of triangle problems where, like, this line and this line are parallel, um, because they do show up so often on the exam, I would just recommend like remembering that, but you can also prove it to yourself with the whole parallel lines thing about like corresponding vertical angles, all that stuff. Um, so like this is going to be equal to A over here because A and A over here is vertical, E and E over here is vertical. If you like do all the transversal stuff, you'll see it's not congruent. It's like there's something, um, there's a different word for it. It's not, um, what is it? Someone said. Oh, it's not alternate exterior. I think it's al it's alternate interior because they're inside of the um, the parallel lines. That's what it is. Thank you. Okay, so alternate interior, that's what I meant. So you could do it like that, like with the um, parallel lines, like remembering that alternate interior angles are going to be equal to each other. Or you can remember that just like the opposite ones with these tri triangle things like are going to be equal to each other. So let's see. Angle E is equal to angle A, and we know that the cosine of B is equal to, this is B, cosine of B, and this has to be a right angle too. Cosine of B, remember cosine is the ka in Sokotoa, so it has to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So cosine of B is equal to x over 5, so this would be x over 5 is equal to the cosine of B right here. Hold on, let me get back on track, sorry. When I was trying to remember that, I got like lost trying to figure out what the word was. Um, hold on. Really quick, really quick. Um, so then that means that these have to be equal, and then these have to be equal for B, or sorry, that's B, yeah. B and D over here. So that means that D plus, um, D plus E have to add up to 90, because 90 plus 90 equals 180 for a triangle. And then E plus, uh, where is that? Or sorry, not E, that's a B, A plus B is equal to 90. So we could probably use the complementary angles thing somehow. So there's like this rule that says like the cosine of like one uh, one angle is equal to the sine of like the complementary angle and like vice versa. You could do it with the sine stuff too. Like sine of theta is equal to cosine of 90 minus theta. So I think that's going to be what helps us here. So cosine of B is equal to X over five. So cosine of B would have to equal the sine of the of A. So cosine of B has to equal the sine of A because they're complementary angles right over here. So that's how I'm getting that. And then because A and E are equal, that means that it also has to equal the sine of E. So then it would have to be sine of E is equal to cosine of B, which we know is equal to X over five. So let's see how that helps us here. So it does have to be equal to X over five. So it definitely has to be something that includes number two right there. Um, it can't be sine of B because I mean, like that doesn't even make sense. Like cosine and sine in the same triangle, like, no, it's not gonna be sine of B. 
we said that it's equal to sine of e if it's a sine of e, but that's kind of like part of the question. And then let's see, the other option is 3 over 5. So let's see. Um, someone said, is this the SAT? This is for ACT right now. Um, so then let's see. Um, really quick. So we're checking three fifths. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. So three fifths, we're checking if that could work for sine of E. So sine of E, if we think of it, oh, I shouldn't have written that there. Sine of E is going to be opposite over um, hypotenuse. That's the sine thing. So it's going to be the opposite side over here over the whatever the um, hypotenuse side is, which is the side across from the right angle right over here. So we're trying to see if that's equal to three fifths. Well, hold on. If sine of E is equal to X over five. Oh, then this is a three, four, five triangle. So yeah, because it's opposite over hypotenuse. So then this would have to be the hypotenuse five. And then at um, the, the value that goes here would have to be the opposite, which would be three. So then that works too. So then it's a three, four, five, like the Pythagorean threes triangle thing. Like where you do like the three, four, five, seven, like, or not seven, uh, eight, 15, 17, all of those that you memorize. That's how you could figure out that that side's three. And then it's just equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is three fifths. So that works too. So then it would be J. Okay, so then let's go to number two. It says um, the table below displays a school's record of absences for 672 students by grade level and reason over a month. Unfortunately, the student made a mistake recording the abs absences in the table above. Um, they found out that 12 of the students who were marked as juniors were not were actually not juniors. After fixing this mistake, 50% of the sophomores were found to be absent because they were sick. Approximately what percent of freshmen were absent because they were sick? So we want the percent of freshmen that are absent when they're sick after we correct this mistake um, of like these 12 students that were marked as juniors but aren't juniors. So it says that 50% of the of sophomores were found to be absent because they were sick. So let's see. What we're going to do is we're going to say, um, so there's 80 that are sick right now before we correct it. So we would say that the sophomores being sick would be 80 plus the X amount of sophomores that are coming from this group of 12 students that we're redistributing to the correct group out of the total number of sophomores, which would be 80 plus 60 plus uh, 30. And that's going to be equal to, they said, 50%. Um, so 50% as a decimal would be 0 0.50 because we just moved the decimal two to the left. So all we need to do is just um, start solving this for what X is, and that's going to help us figure out um, how many freshmen we should be adding onto the sick freshman group over here afterwards, after we account for like, let me do it out first. Like it's hard to like say the whole thing at the same time. So basically X is the number of sophomores that we're adding on that are sick from these 12 students. So we're trying to find out the sophomores right now that are sick that we're adding on. So it's going to be 80 plus X over 170 is equal to 0.5. So then we're going to um, multiply each side by, um, or sorry, 170 plus X. I forgot to do the plus X right there. Plus X because we have to add them onto the bottom too. Um, so then it's because it's not just the number that are sick that are going up. It's the total number of sophomores that are going up. So then it's going to be 80 plus X is equal to a half times all of that. So if we do, um, what is a half of 70, that's going to, or 170, that's going to be 85 plus 0.5 X. So now we have to get the X's together and the numbers together. So let's subtract 0.5 X from each side. So that's going to be 80 plus, um, that's going to be plus 0.5 X is equal to 85. Now let's subtract 80 from each side. And then we're going to get 0.5 X is equal to 5. So then when I divide by 0.5 on each side, I'm going to get that X is equal to 10. So remember, X was the number of sophomores that we were adding on from this group of 12 students that were mistakenly categorized as sick juniors. So if 10 of those were actually sophomores, that means the remaining amount have to be sick freshmen. So that means that there has to be two sick freshmen that we're adding on here. Remember, we're trying to find the percent of freshmen that were sick. So it's going to be 70 plus 2, which is 72, plus if we add up all the freshmen. So 72 plus 45 plus 20. And then we would just multiply that by 100 to get the percent. So that would just be 72 over, and then let's see, that would be 
um, 137. And then we just have two times by 100. So then you would just put me at, or put, <laughs> put that in the calculator. And then that would be 52.554, yada, yada, yada. So like 52.54, blah, 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 blah. So which of these is it closest to? Because it says approximately. So that would have to be C. Where'd you get the 100 from? Because, um, well, you could do it a different way, actually. You might be used to doing it as like you have the fraction um, amount and to turn it into a percent, you just move it two to the right after you turn this into a decimal. Or you just always turn like a fraction into a percent by multiplying by 100. Either way, it works. So then um, let's go to the next problem. Number three. So it says, if a rectangular solid has a length of five, width of four, and a height of three, then what is the length of the diagonal? Okay, I apologize in advance for my drawing skills. They're not great. Um, so if we have a rectangular solid... Um, and the length is going to be 5, the width is going to be 4, and the height is going to be 3. And we want to find the length of the diagonal of the rectangular solid. That's important. So a lot of people will get confused on these problems because they'll be like thinking that they have to find just the diagonal down here of the base. We want the diagonal of the whole solid. So again, I'm trying my best to do this drawing, but it's going to be like basically like if you went from the like think of a shoebox. If you went from the um, bottom left front corner of the shoebox to like the back of the shoebox in the top right, that's the diagonal of the solid right here. So what that does is it can help you create like a right triangle that has like the diagonal of the base is one of the legs of this right triangle and the height here is the other leg, the three. And then we would find this D diagonal right here um, to solve the problem. Now, remember, you can use Pythagorean theorem to find missing sides of a triangle, but only when you have like two of the other sides already. So in order to, for us to find out what D is, we have to find out what this dotted line is, like what the length of this dotted line is. Well, that dotted line just so happens to be part of a right triangle in the base. So like there's a right triangle right there on the base where the dotted line is the hypotenuse and four and five are the legs. So remember Pythagorean theorem says if we do the legs um, squared and added, so four squared plus five squared, it should be equal to, let's call this C, the um, diagonal of the base squared. So this would be 16 plus 25 is equal to C squared. So that's gonna be 41 is equal to C squared, square root each side to get C by itself. So then that square root of 41 is equal to C. So C is equal to the square root of 41. Now I can solve for D because I know two of my um, length, the lengths of my two legs for this right triangle right here, where three is one of the legs. So three squared plus root 41 is another one of the legs is equal to um, the diagonal of the solid D squared. So now I'm just gonna solve for what D is. So it's gonna be nine plus 41 is equal to D squared. So this is going to be 50 is equal to D squared. And we're going to square root each side. So then we get the square root of 50 is equal to D. 50 is the same thing as saying 25 times 2. So then 25 is a perfect square. We could take out a 5 because the square root of 25 is 5. And then leave the 2 on the inside. So 5 root 2 is equal to D. So it would be G. Correct for anyone that said 5 root 2. Good job. So let's keep going. Number four says, one traffic light changes every nine seconds and another traffic light changes every 15 seconds. At one point, the two lights change at the same time. How many seconds elapse until, um, until the two lights change again at the same time? Okay, so let's write out like what's happening with these two lights. So one of them is gonna change every nine seconds. So it changes at second nine, at second 18, at second 27, at second 36, et cetera, et cetera. And then one of them is changing every 15 seconds. So at 15, 30, 45. So we want to see like at what time are they both going to change? So if I kept going with this one, I would get that 45 is also a um, one of the multiples of nine and it's a multiple of 15. So where it matches in the list would be at 45 seconds. 
So 45 seconds would elapse before they change at the same time. So it would be D. Okay, give me one second to grab water, guys. Oh, and I'm not even checking my editing thing. Hold on one second. Um, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. That's good, okay. So then um, let's go to number five. So it says the figure shown above um, is a regular octagon. What is the value of all of this? So this is a regular octagon. So X and Y are the, um, the, the measures of those angles right over here. So if we can find out what the measures of those angles is, angles are, sorry, we can just plug that in here to find out what this whole value is. So remember, there's like this formula that says the sum of the interior angles is equal to um, this formula right here, where n is the number of sides. This is an octagon, a regular octagon, so that means that n is 8. It has 8 sides. So to find the sum of every single inside angle there, it's going to be equal to 8 minus 2, which is just 6, times 180 over here. Now, what you're also going to do, that's the sum of every single angle. If you want to find the sum of just, um, or sorry, the measure of just one of these angles, so like this guy here, or just this guy here, or this guy here, whatever, what you need to do is divide by how many sides there are, which are eight. So when you solve all this, you get what one of these angles is equal to, which will help you figure out what X and Y are essentially. So let's see, when we put that all in, that's going to be um, 135. So each of these angles is going to be equal to 135. So this right here, y plus this 90 degree angle equals 135. So y plus 90 degrees equals 135 degrees. And you'll see the same thing right here. x plus 90 degrees should also equal the 135 degrees. So let's subtract 90 from each side, and then we're going to get that x is equal to 45, and also that y is equal to 45 degrees. So we can plug that in for x and y here. Um, this is for the um, ACT right now, but a lot of this will help you with the SAT as well. So then it's going to be 3 times the square root of x cubed, but I'm going to move this y to the negative 1 um, to the bottom right over here because it's a, the negative exponent rule. So now I have something that's a little bit easier to work with. And before I plug in the 45 and 45 for x and y. So it's going to be 3 times the square root of 45 cubed over 45 squared times 45. So now I'm just going to simplify this. Well, 45 cubed, 45 can be taken out definitely because 45 times 45 times 45, there's a pair of 45s in there for sure. So we could take out a 45, and we could leave the 45 in there for now. And then we could say, hey, we have 45 squared times 45. This and this cancel out the factor on top and bottom. I can also say that 45 is the same thing as 9 times 5. So then I can simplify this and say, okay, the square root of 9 is 3, so I can take out a 3. So it's going to be 3 times 3 root 5 over 45 times 45, because 45 squared is just 45 times 45. Now, this is going to be equal to 9. So 9 root 5 over 45 times 45. I know that not, uh, 45 can be broken up into 9 and 5, so I can cancel out a 9 here and a 9 here, and just be left with 5 times 45. So then this is going to be root 5 over 5 times 45. Well, when you do 5 times 45, that's 225, so it's root 5 over 225, which is going to be H. So let's go to number 6. Um, what grade math is this? This is for the ACT math, um, so it's not like grade level specific. It covers, like, it's testing on everything before calculus. Um, so let's go to number 6. Given that X and Y are real numbers and 0 it, um, and X is... Um, X could be between or equal to 0 and 3, and y is greater than or equal to 4. The expression right here can have which of the following values. Okay, so um, let's think what's the fastest way to do this. Um, so I could probably just start with process of elimination. So 
Um, I know that the X always has to be less than the Y over here, so I'm never going to get a negative number on top, and also my Ys can only be positive numbers, so there's no way to get a negative answer, so I can cross out A and B automatically. Okay, so then let's keep going. Let's see. Can it ever be zero? I could probably figure that out quite easily, so let's see. Um, it's never going to be zero because this is always going to be less than what Y is. Um, X is always going to be less than what Y is, so you're never going to get like a zero on top. So it can't be that one. So then it would have to be like one of these. And I could just, it's probably going to be D, but like, let's verify it. Is there a way that we could get one half from out of this equation? Well, I see that if I put four in for Y and I put two in for X, I could get two fourths, which is the same thing as saying one half. So it would be D. Thank you guys for sharing the live. Um, so let's keep going to now we're on number seven okay given that a b and c are all integers b is a negative integer and zero and c as ah, c is greater than zero and all that i'm not going to say that which of the following could be the graph of all of this so just like with the y equals mx plus b stuff you want to get y by itself to like determine the characteristics of the graph so I'm going to try to get y by itself by moving um, these other stuff away from y. So I'm going to subtract from um, I'm going to subtract bx from each side. So then I'm going to get cy is greater than or equal to a minus bx. Now I have to divide by c to get y by itself. So y is going to be greater than or equal to a over c minus bc times x. Now remember, they told us b is negative, and they told us essentially that c and a are positive because they're both greater than zero. So it might help if you put like a visual there, like that's negative, this is positive, and this is positive as well. So remember, the slope is what's being multiplied by um, the, by um, being multiplied by x. So negative b over c is our slope. So if negative b over c is our slope and b is a negative number, like let's just say it was negative one, like you could just plug in a number to kind of like test it. Let's say that B was negative one because it's just a negative number. And then let's say that C was, I don't know, two. Then that would have to be equal to a positive slope. So we need to look for one of these that has a positive slope. So it could only be this one, this one, this one, or this one. It can't be E because that's a negative slope. It also cannot be A because you see how there's that little line under the inequality symbol. When we have that little line, it means that this can't be dotted. It has to be solid like one of these. So it can't be A. So now we're deciding between B, C, and D. So now let's see what the y-intercept should be. So the y-intercept is going to be what's floating on by itself over here, A over C, which are both positive. So we need a positive y-intercept. So it could be this one. It cannot be this one. And it could be this one. So now we're determining between B and D. So now you see how the difference um, between these is where it's shaded, either on top and bottom. So once you get y by itself, if y is, um, if the, basically if the alligator mouth is like how you guys learned this in elementary school, if the alligator mouth is eating the y, then it goes above. It's shading above. If the alligator mouth is not opening towards the y, then it's below. The alligator mouth is opening towards the y, so it would be d and not be. Okay, so then let's go to number eight here. So it says, um, a new bakery in town offers three types of bread. Oh, and also before I keep going, um, I'm sorry if I missed any of your questions. I'm going to leave time at the end for questions if anybody has anything that they want to ask. Sorry, I try not to get too distracted by comments. But if you're interested in my books, I have an SAT one as well. This is what it's called. It's available on Amazon, Overcoming ACT Math by Sophia Garcia. And these videos get uploaded to go with the book on YouTube. So let's keep going. Um, number eight says a new bakery in town offers three types of bread, white, whole grain, and rye, and four types of fillings, chicken, tuna, beef, and vegetable. How many different sandwiches with white bread and two fillings can a customer order? Okay, so they have one bread option, right? They said, what was it, the um, uh, white bread. So they want the white bread. So they have one bread option times the combination of the filling options that they have. So there's four fillings that they can choose from, and they're going to pick two at a time. 
So it would be this combination. You have this in your calculator. Um, like you can plug this in just like that. And like your R in the calculator would be two and the N would be four if you want. Or you can use the formula, which I'm going to show you just for fun, which would be um, that we would have the N factorial over and then it would be the R factorial times the N minus R factorial. And then we could say, um, I'm going to just get rid of the one because times one is like meaningless. So four factorial means we have four times three times two times one. That's what that little factorial means. Um, it's basically like you're multiplying by one less until you get to one. So two factorial means this. And four minus two is just two factorial. So two factorial, again, would just be two times one. So we can eliminate two times one on top and bottom. And then we could say, hey, we're left with four times three over two, which is just 12 over two, which is just six. So it would be F. So let's go to number nine. So uh, someone said, how do you get numbers from that? What do you, what numbers? So there's one bread option that you would um, be multiplying times the, um, the combination of like different uh, what is it like sandwich filling options that you have? So that this we call n the what's taking place over here. That's n. That's the total number of stuff that you have to choose from basically. And then how many you pick at a time? We call it r, which in this case would be two because you're picking like two different fillings at a time. So that's how I got where these numbers are. So I got like the total number that I'm picking from for fillings is four, and then I'm picking two at a time for my r for the combination stuff. So this is the combination formula. It's a function in your calculator, or you can memorize the formula, which the formula says that the combination would be n factorial over um, r factorial times n minus r factorial is like equal to the combination of whatever n and r are. So you can do it in your calculator, or you can plug it in. So then let's go to number nine. Which of the following is not true regarding the system of inequalities right here? So again, there's a typo, so just pretend that this says both. Um, both are in quadrant two. So remember the quadrants. This is quadrant one, this is quadrant two, this is quadrant three, and this is quadrant four, right over here. Now, what I would do, since this is the ACT, is I would literally just graph these in my graphing calculator. So I'm gonna do that on Desmos off to the side really quick so I can like show you what that looks like. One second, guys. Okay, I got it. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so basically you just plug these into your calculator. And when you do, this is what it's going to look like right here. So this is quadrant one. This is quadrant two. This is quadrant three. This is quadrant four. So we want to see um, which of these is not true. So let's see, are they both in quadrant one? Are they both in quadrant two or, or three is what we're checking. So they're both in quadrant one. So that's true. We want what's not true. They're neither of them are in quadrant two. Both of them are in quadrant three and both of them are in quadrant four. So the one that they're not in is quadrant two. So Right over here, it says that both are in quadrant two. That's not true. That's what we're looking for. So it would be one. Um, so then let's go to number 10. Susan is going to toss a coin four times. What is the probability of her getting at least three heads? Okay, so let's think. So the option, the ways that like the ways that she could get at least three heads, let's label that out where like H is the heads and T is the tails. So she's flipping it four times. It could go like this, or we could have that it goes like this, or we could have that it would be like heads, heads, tails, heads, or we could have that it would be, um, it would be, let's see, tails, heads, heads, heads I haven't done yet, or it could be all heads. And each of these would be um, showing that there's like at least three heads that she tossed with her coin. So like this is what we're interested in her getting one of these options. So there's five ways to, for her to get five ways that she could get at least. Um, ooh, that's supposed to be a five. Five ways that she could get at least three heads when she tosses those coins. 
Now we have to think, okay, remember probability is what we're being asked about, the five ways out of the total number of ways that um, like th this coin toss could go. So the total number of possible outcomes would be two to the fourth because she's, to she's tossing the coin four times. So it would be two times two times two times two because she has two options times two options times two times two. So that's the same thing as two to the fourth. So then it would be five over what two to the fourth is, which is 32. Yeah. So it'd be five over, um, is it five? Or, no, sorry. Hold on. Two to the fourth ah, is 16. I was doing two to the fifth. Whoopsies. So then we would put that into our calculator. So that would be five over 16. Five divided by 16 is 0 0.3125. So that would be H. So then let's go to number 11. It says, given that the average of P and Q is 16, um, then R is equal to 8. What is the average of P, Q, and R? Okay, so remember, average is the same thing as mean. Um, so if we say that we're trying to find the mean of P and Q, we would say that we're adding it, dividing by 2, and then that equals 16. Some, oh wait, people are confused about the two things. So like there's two options, like you can do heads or tails. Like you have two options, heads or tails that you could get. And you're tossing the coin four different times. So if I want the total number of options I have, it would be two times two times two times two. Because I have two options times the two options times the two options times the two options, which is the same thing as two to the fourth, which is just 16. And then the five ways, like the five options about like how I could get at least three heads would be I could do heads, 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 tails. Or then I could, when I toss it four times, I could get heads, tails, heads, heads. Or I could get heads, heads, tails, heads. Or I could get te um, tails, heads, heads, heads. Heads, 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 heads. Those are all the options that I have for getting at least three heads out of my total number of options, which is two to the fourth, two times two times two. So then it would be five over 16. So then now let's go back to this problem. So the average of P and Q is 16. So P plus Q divided by how many things we're adding to gives us the mean or the average, which is 16. So that means that P plus Q has to be equal to, let's multiply each side by two and get 32. They want to know what's the average of P, Q, and R. So the average of P, Q, and R can be found by adding them up and dividing by how many we're adding, which is 3. And that has to equal what the answer to our question is. So now we're going to say, okay, well, we know P plus Q is 32, so I can replace that with 32. I could say that R I know is 8. And then we're going to divide by 3 to get what our answer to our question is. So this is going to be 40 over 3. And that equals the answer to our question. If we do 40 over 3 in our calculator, that would be 13.33333, so it would be C. Thank you so much for the roses. Okay, so let's go to number 12. It says, which of the following could be the value of x in the equation? So um, someone said, how is it C? So C, um, so... 40 divided by 3, just do that in your calculator. I mean, you have you can do it by hand if you want to, but this is the ACT, you have your calculator. And it's going to be 13.3333, like forever. So the closest one would be C. So for number 12, which of the following could be the value of x in the equation? So right away I see that it definitely, x can definitely not be equal to 3. Because they, um, they like to test this a lot, just so you know. Um, well, not a lot, but I would say like it shows up more frequently than other stuff. Where they want you to remember that the denominator cannot ever equal 0 because we can never divide by 0. So like if we set x, equals neg x minus 3 equal to 0, that would mean that x would have to be 3, which is impossible because we don't want to get 0. So x cannot be 3. So automatically we can cross out these two right there. Now, I'm going to try factoring this. And I'm going to say that x... Um, I could take out the greatest common factor of x here, because x goes into both of these, and then I'll be left with x minus 3 in my parentheses and put that all over x minus 3, and that's equal to negative 3. Now I can cross these out, and then I just have x is equal to negative 3. So it would have to be f. Thank you for the roses. So let's go to number 13. Um, <laughs> 
uh, assume that the number of bees in a hive triples every four years. If the current number of bees is 15, then how many bees will be in the hive 16 years from now? So the current number of bees is 15, right? So that's what you're starting with. And then this is like the exponential function formula. I think that's what it's called. I always get like, I think of math and numbers and not like vocabulary words. So I always like end up messing up like what the name of something is, but it's this guy right here. If you're used to this equation, I think I'm pretty sure it's called like the exponential function equation or something like that. Um, so the A is like the starting amount 15. So you do the starting amount 15 times, um, like the, the rate of growth in this case, cause it's going to be, um, growing like the, the, the population, the number of bees is growing by tripling every year. So it would be three cause that's like the rate of growth it triples every four years. So then this is where you have to be careful. It's asking you how many bees will there be in 16 years from now. So you have to think how many times is it going to triple? If it's 16 years from now and it only triples once every four years, 16 divided by four is four. So that means it's going to triple four times. So we would have to do 15 times three to the fourth. So what you would do is just put that into your calculator, 15 times three to the fourth, and that's going to be 1215F.